She's been called the Oprah Winfrey of China. Forbes magazine named Chinese journalist and media entrepreneur Yang Luan one of the world's 100 most powerful women. In China, her name is practically synonymous with entertainment. She's the co-founder of one of the country's largest private media companies. And she's committed to creating programming that encourages the continuing growth of Chinese culture and offering an international platform for cultural exchanges. Her signature television show, Yang Luan One on One, has become China's longest running talk show. In addition, she served as a cross-cultural ambassador for China, playing an important part in Beijing's successful bid for the 2008 Olympic Games. A dedicated philanthropist, she served as a UNICEF ambassador for China and has dedicated her own foundation to the growth of civil society. Recently, CCTV's May Lee had a chance to sit down with the legendary Yang Luan at the 2015 annual meeting of the Clinton Global Initiative. Yang Luan, thank you so much for your time. Of course, you. I appreciate you being here. For you, I know that uh, some of the most important issues are about women, you know, women empowerment and children's causes and health, areas of health. So tell me what it is that drives you to care about these causes that are of global importance. Well, thank you. I Actually, I started by thinking of my own show. <laughs> About um, eight years ago, I started a new talk show called Her Village, and this is a women's show. So we combine storytelling with topic discussion. Well, that's kind of in the nature of a media person, right? But I, I was so inspired by these extraordinary women telling their stories and also were fascinated by the topics that we are also engaged uh, uh, in. And also it's such a great platform to connect Chinese women and with the international communities. So it then it went on very naturally to be built into a cross-media community, both online, offline, traditional media and new media uh, for women's leadership and empowerment. And at the same time, we figure out that uh, uh, in this whole process of fast transformation of China, women are sometimes uh, stressed out. They try to manage their career uh, and then family and all sorts of different cultural expectations of them. And, and they cannot do it as only one individual. They, they, it takes a village. Also, it takes the engagement and partnership with men so that we can support each other at the family level, institutional level, and the social level. So that's why um, uh, three years ago I started uh, uh, Her Village International Forum, uh, for which both women leadership and women well-being are very important issues to be covered. We have international speakers to cover those uh, subjects, to give women information, inspiration, and also building up a sharing community um, so that their self-generated content uh, also become a part of the dialogue. Uh, so this is some of the, the, the things I've been doing for the past few years. And we do know that women love to share. We love to have dialogue. We love to be able to try to come together as a group mm -hmm. to try to empower each other. Yes. So it's great to hear that in China that's happening more and more. Definitely. Um, and there's, it's being received really well by yeah. women. And technology and social media is only accelerated the whole process. Uh, during our this year's forum, for example, within a week's of time, our social media site had more than 190 million hits. Wow. Well, that's how massive the reaction was. So we are also uh, sending out uh, you know, free videos on the highlights of the speeches of all our speakers and then uh, organize discussions uh, among our attendees as well as our audience. And also at the same time, we're teaming up with the top educational institutions like here Barnard College at Columbia University, uh, Beijing Normal University, to curate programs for young women leaders for their leadership training, for uh, the well-being, self-knowledge, relationship kind of, uh, you know, training. Um, uh, so that they can better adapt and lead the changes. Mm -hmm. You were appointed U UNICEF amb ambassador, um, the first Chinese UNICEF ambassador in 2010, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I wonder, you know, in the years that you were appointed, what kinds of changes have you seen uh, in your work, not just with UNICEF, but obviously you're talking about the work that you're doing now. Um, the country is changing, it seems, by the day. <laughs> Right, in well, so many ways. Yes, well, the economic changes are very visible 
But I think what is more fundamental is about the changes of our mindset uh, about people. Uh, or in the past, the Chinese government was kind of ruling all and being responsible for everything. But then it's the upcoming of the market power and then the civic society, which are forming a stronger uh, pillars of the society. Uh, so um, uh, in the year of 2010, um, my foundation, Sun Culture Foundation, co-hosted the Giving Pledge Dinner with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So both Bill and Warren Buffett were there in Beijing meeting the top Chinese leaders in business and philanthropy. At that time, there were only about a dozen uh, private, I mean, family, back, uh, family background uh, foundations. Now we have more than 2,000. Wow. So this is how uh, everything is paced up, not just uh, in the market and the economic side, but also on philanthropy and civic society building. Uh, more than four million uh, NGOs have been uh, growing up uh, for the past uh, decade or so. So it's, it's extraordinary change. And I find that fascinating because uh, I covered the UN Women's uh, Conference 20 years ago. <laughs> okay. And so social change, phil philanthropy, NGOs, those were still very unknown concepts, right? Oh, very new. And I remember the Chinese being a little bit questioning, like, what is this all about? So it's great to see that there has been the sea change in the attitude of philanthropy and giving and charity, Definitely. right? Definitely. I, I remember because at the time I was studying uh, in the graduate school of um, uh, international and public affairs at Columbia University. So one night I got this call from Beijing saying you have to come back you know, for a short break because we need you to host the opening ceremony of UN Conference on Women. And this is by far the biggest international conference that Beijing has ever hosted. You know, it, that was way before the Olympics and right, things like that. So I rushed back and, and it was a great experience. At that time, Chinese people were not very much aware of the very concept of NGO. Uh, and uh, through some of the news reporting, they thought that NGO people were kind of a little bit extremist right. and they could do crazy stuff to That's catch right. attention. So actually, they prepared hundreds of sheets in case anything like a naked parade uh, took place. <laughs> so <laughs> it just shows how uh, 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 alien you know, people felt uh, towards NGO. But now um, the civic society is really growing, uh, uh, um, the crowdfunding on the internet, uh, grassroots community level uh, NGOs uh, are really growing very fast. So I'm very happy to see the changes. It is wonderful to see. And, and you have to give credit to social media mm -hmm. and how that's inspiring and changing behavior in China. Yes. Right. And I know you've talked uh, about microblogging in China and how that creates a different community mm. of voices to be more expressive. That's which, right. again, in the past, maybe weren't permitted to do. So That's right. if you could just touch upon that idea. Yes, of course. Uh, well, by working in media, especially traditional mainstream media like television, uh, we knew that it was quite elite oriented. You know, there are a bunch of uh, editors and journalists deciding which story goes first. But with social media and the internet, now everyone has a place to uh, take their message out and, and give their, uh, themselves their voices. And of course, you, you, you will find a little bit disorientation in the middle of this, but overall speaking, it's such a, a democratic uh, process of the whole society. So now you see people are talking about things like the environment issues, uh, you know, the women's rights issues on the internet quite openly, and you see um, uh, more and more so uh, a positive interaction between public policy and, uh, you know, people's uh, opinions. And you see NGOs are uh, working with the government, forming this public and private uh, partnership uh, in the environmental monitoring, uh, in the advancement of, of education, poverty relief, and, and many other things going on. And I think with the youth becoming more aware of these yeah. issues, that yes. is probably pushing that forward even more. Definitely. With your foundation, the Sun Foundation, mm -hmm. that culture, culture foundation, that's obviously an area you know, of development for, for you to also work on, right? To try to push these social issues and these cultural issues that are important 
for the future future generations of China. Yes, talking about future impact, uh, nothing is more important and effective than education. What I have found, um, there are two issues uh, in terms of education that I feel that I need to address to. One is that um, there's not equal access to education resources from the rural areas to the urban areas. And we found that with those children who are coming into big cities with their working parents uh, from the rural areas, uh, they are the most vulnerable uh, community uh, which don't have access to high quality education. The second problem is that our very definition and understanding of education was very much knowledge and skill based instead of you know, liberal arts and, and uh, you know, critical thinking nurturing. Uh, so to try to address to those uh, two issues, I um, and my colleagues in Sun Culture Foundation, we developed art educational programs for underprivileged children. We have uh, enabled more than uh, 30,000 uh, children of migrant workers in Beijing to have regular music and art classes. Uh, we also organized more than a dozen uh, performing troops uh, for those young kids so that they can, they, they, they sang to President Carter when he was in Beijing. Oh, wow. They could uh, uh, get on the stage of National Performing Center Theater. Right. Uh, so a lot of things are really giving those children voices and also give them opportunities to realize their potentials. Right, and be more creative. Definitely. Right. Young Lan, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. It really was a pleasure talking thank you, to you. Thank you, May. We'll be right back with this week's full frame closing.